Hello, everybody. So, I have decided to, uh, in between major mechanics, I think it's about time I go into detail about advantages in particular. In most of my videos, I either skim over them or only point out important advantages, but I felt like it'd be a good idea for new players to make a comprehensive advantage guide. So I'm going to go through every advantage in every book except for the... No, I should go with those advantages too. Here, I'm going to also do the advantages for the Gaia book. I forgot for a moment those existed. I have the second Gaia book, a, a very poor fan translation of it. But I will go to these advantages as well. So there will be a bit of jumping around in some of the books, because in the Dominance Exit book, there are two places for advantage-like things I'll have to go through. But we're starting off with the core rulebook first. And in this video, we'll cover every book. From core to GM toolkit as well. And Dominus Exit, Arcana Exit, and finally Gaia. In not exactly in that order. Uh, <clears throat> I will try and remember to put some time codes as well for each individual book discussion in case you want to skip around between them. But I might forget that, so sorry. Anyways, without further ado, let's start with the common advantages in the core rulebook, starting with adding one point to a characteristic. This is one of the few advantages you can take as many times as you want. And it allows you to increase a stat by one. This can be very powerful. So you cannot increase a stat that's a physical stat higher than 11. And you cannot increase a mental stat, so that's intelligence, power, willpower, and perception, beyond 13. This is important to know, because this is way better for spellcasters and characters who use their mental stats than melee characters who use their physical stats or ranged characters who use their physical stats or technicians. Because raising something like your power to 13 at level 1 is incredibly broken. And so is raising your willpower to 13 at level 1. Or, yeah, having 11 strength at level 1 isn't as good as 13 power at level 1. I'd recommend this advantage if you want to power game a wizard or a mentalist to have 13 power or willpower, respectively. Or to power game a wizard or a summoner to have very high power and have lots of, lots of Xeon regen. 13 is one of the breakpoint numbers for your MA increasing from 15 from 10 to 15, which is huge. Very, very huge. Suddenly, you only need to get four multiples in total to get to that first spellcasting breakpoint of 60 Xeon, because most base level spells cost 60 Xeon. And the stat bonus for your power is nice for your ability to uh, increase your summoning abilities. And power is just a very good stat in general. If you're going for a key user and stuff, the 11 is not very useful. It is nice. It is the next modifier of 15 and going into 20. So it's not like useless, but it's better. And the other downside is if you do have 11 strength or something like that, you can't benefit from having 11 in a physical stat until you gain in humanity. So if you're getting 11 strength, you also might need to get martial mastery just to be able to have inhumanity to benefit from it. So it's a, it's not worth it. Whereas with mental stats, you do not need inhumanity or zen to use their upper limits of ability. So keep that in mind. In the core rulebook, acute senses is pretty good if you really want to never be snuck up on. The plus one to perception for characteristic checks is pointless. But the plus 30 to nose and search is very good. For everything but a ranger, that is 60 free development points for one creation point, which isn't terrible. And it's just very nice. If you don't know what to get and you want to be the trap finder of the party, a cute sentence is a safe bet to go with. Anyone else? Not so much. So artifacts, depending on your starting level, can vary in strength. In fact... For Artifact, we should actually have the Prometheum Exit book open so we can explain what that actually gives you. Because if you only have the core rulebook, the Artifact advantage is subjective completely to the DM. But with the Prometheum Exit book, we're just quickly scrolling through it to this part, you can actually see what you should get from this advantage based on your character level. So at level 1, if you put one creation point, that's a 1 plus Artifact. Those are pretty meh. 
at level at two creation points that's a two artifact that's basically a common magical weapon and two plus is a very good magical weapon consider the two of power level for magical items to be very good magical items two and three are the like the good points and anything above that is really op so yeah for level one make sure to at least put two creation points into it I, i'd say because the one plus thing the dm might pull from the book for you from here if they don't make you a custom one which they could make you a custom one i'd recommend advocating for a custom one but to give you an idea of like a one plus artifact from this book it could be a fire gem for example which is really just a grenade or a crafting ingredient or it could be a soul shard lets you see spirits which isn't terrible lets you capture stuff too that's a, this is a good one for a summoner i wouldn't be too upset if the summoner forgot that there's a lamp of oneros lets you see into dreams and stuff and as you can see most of the stuff like there are some good effects don't get me wrong there are some good ones but you definitely want to get into that power level two and two plus category because that's when you start getting magical weapons and equipment that is very useful no matter what character you are and there's a much wider selection of stuff to look at so artifact is good if you are willing to put at least two cp into it level one i'd recommend going all in with it though if you're going to get it and just getting a really cool like custom artifact from your dm ambidextrous uh, see it's good and bad i feel good because if you want to make two attacks per round level one you can do so without sacrificing much to your defense ability to have that extra attack with your offhand other than that unless you really want the dual wield or you know if you want to do the thing where your enemy breaks your right arm you can then use your left arm to fight still that's good it's not bad at all actually i feel it is uh overpicked by a lot of players because they feel like dual wielding is good and it is it's pretty good it's one extra attack and i feel it is best with characters who aren't going to develop many key techniques and they want an extra attack if you are a key user i don't think this is a good one to pick only because if you want more attacks you should just make a key technique that gives you more attacks at no penalty increase one characteristic to nine costs you two cp you can always take this one as many times as you want. So, this one is good if you're rolling stats and you roll up poor stats. And your the rest of your stats are really good, but you have that one four that you rolled. And you want to make sure all your stats are all like a eight or higher. You'd pick that advantage for this. This is more for a technician or key user who needs a lot of high stats. And you want to make sure you have enough 9s and 10s and stuff to make sure you have a lot of high starting accumulations. Other than that, I wouldn't pick it. Uh, it can be very good, obviously, to get 5 stat points for 2 CP. But at the same time, there are other advantages, I feel, that give you more benefits. Access to one sake discipline. This advantage falls into a special category of required by prerequisite to do other cool things. You might want to pick this just so you can play a mentalist, but you don't want to be a full on mentalist. You want to be a one trick pony. So if you're like a warrior mentalist, this is the one for you probably. <clears throat> because maybe you only want physical increase or one school of mentalism, and therefore you pick up this one. And that's how you roll. That's how that's how I got to tell you about it. Uh, don't pick it if you're not going to be mentalist. Charm and disquieting, I'll describe together. One gives you improved personal magnetism, and one makes you naturally imposing towards those around you. And the effect is left ambiguous. It's up to the GM to describe how good it should be. So if you're going to take these advantages, discuss them with your GM first to figure out what their capabilities really will be in this campaign. For me, when I DM Anima, in my opinion, if you are charming, the way I treat it is that when it comes to minor NPCs, who I, minor, bleh, minor NPCs who I feel should be easily susceptible to, the, to be to a charming person, I will say you would automatically succeed in rather easy things to convince them of or to seduce them, for example. 
Same thing with the squiding. If they are easily, someone who I deem easily intimidatable, someone with the squiding would automatically intimidate them. Against someone who's more resilient to charming effects or someone who's intimidating, I'd say you would treat it like some of the advantages in later books, which give you extra tiers of success. So what I would say is if you are charming or disquieting and you're rolling a persuasion or intimidate check for them, you would gain one tier of success when you uh, when you roll these checks. Uh, I'm using the wrong terminology for what it's called in the game. So I'm just going to pull up my GM screen real quick and tell you what I mean by that directly. Did it? Oh, sorry. I thought I crashed for a second, but it didn't. So I'm just going to go up to the difficulty chart. So if you, let's say you rolled a 20, instead of getting routine, you would have an easy level of difficulty success is what I mean by tier of success, by the way. So that's how I'd recommend using them. But as a DM, maybe you might want to make it different. Animal affinity is another one that is determined by the DM how useful it is. But basically, what it does is it means animals who are attacking you will generally not. And even if it's a trained animal to attack you, it would likely bark at you first to give you a chance to run away or yell at you. Or give you some notice that it's going to maul you in the face. That's what it does in gentle terms. Uh, I'd also say this advantage give you a benefit to... Uh, the animal's skill when it comes to befriending an animal, and should make it easier. And all suggests that when combat against an animal is unavoidable, a character of this advantage will be always the last person attacked if he's in a group. So it's basically an advantage you take if you really want to deal with animals. It's a flareful, subjective one. It's pretty nice. And it can allow you to leverage it in this, a way to get an animal companion or a pet, as I'll call it, without being a summoner. So I like it. It's a pretty cool advantage. Danger Sense is a great advantage if you want to be a bit of a power gaming character. If you have Danger Sense, you no longer need to take the Notice skill. Why? Because it makes you immune to being surprised by surprise attacks via stealth. The only way to be surprised to get that negative for it is with someone rolling 150 or higher than you on initiative. So as a power gamer, that means you can completely dump the notice skill and be okay with guys sneaking up on you because you will not get the surprise penalty. You'll turn around the last second and fight them. That does mean you'll still walk in the traps if you want to do that, but it does allow you the option to not be afraid of ninjas. So if you want to not be afraid of ninjas and shit, you take danger sense. It's the way to go if you want that. Been around is a great advantage if you like being the big boy in the party. The man who wears the biggest pants. Uh, never take it at cost one because getting 50 extra experience isn't very good. You want that 100 because at level one, getting 100 extra experience means you level up. If you're level two, uh, you want to pick 150 to level three. If that's how you're starting the campaign. <laughs> That means if you pick level 2 on this bad boy and level 1, that means you immediately get a stat point, you immediately level up, and get 100 more DP. If you want to lead your party, this is a good way to do it. I would highly recommend. Cat, no. My cat looks like he wants to jump in my lap, and I don't want that right now. Get out of here. Get out of here. Sorry about that. So aptitude in a subject is great for any character. If there is a secondary ability you want, a specific one that is, and uh, you only want one to be cheaper for you, it's a good way to make it affordable. You can invest one or two CP into it, and you can take it as many times as you want, I believe, as well. But it lets you reduce the cost ratio of a skill from three to two, or two to one if you spend two points. Uh, sorry, three to two with one point, three to one with two, or two to one with one. That's all it does. It's very good. Especially if you're looking to do builds using the acrobatic skill or sleight of hand. Access to natural psychic powers is a weird one. It lets you have one psychic ability that you can use once every little bit. Uh, once per minute, to be precise. 
And it lets you pick the difficult level that you unleash it at, from difficult at one point, very difficult, and absurd level 3. This one's pretty good. It's not good with, like, attacking abilities, but it's great for, like, supporting ones. So if you want to fly or jump real high and do stuff like that for, like, one round, that's the one you take, man. It's really good. I like it. It's really flavorful and cool. None of the players take it. Aptitude in a field is the big brother of aptitude in a subject. Instead of just one secondary ability, it's all the secondary abilities in a field. It only reduces the cost by one, but that usually means you're putting in a field that where that fee whole field costs two to one, and now you're making it one to one. If there's a lot of skills you want to get, you pick that one. It's really good as well. Repeat a characteristic roll is a trap. Don't take it. It's terrible. If you want to re-roll your, your stat roll, you're better off spending two to guarantee it being nine. Because you have a one in, you have a if using normal rules, you have about a four in ten shot of a uh, of sorry, a six in ten shot of a uh, of rolling any results from four to ten. Assuming your DM doesn't let you roll three, two, and one. So if you rolled a four, then it might be worth it. Because the worst result for you is nothing. And the next worst result is the same as increasing it by one, by you getting a five. So if you're willing to gamble, it's okay, but I wouldn't recommend this one. It's a bit too much RNG to be safe. Martial Mastery. It's a good one. If you want to start the game off with uh, key techniques, this is the one you pick. It gives you access, if you take the three point of it, to one or two key techniques. Level 2 can get you all the key passive abilities you need to make techniques. And then from there, it would allow you to maybe make one. Uh, depending on your class. Because if you were to use this at level 2, you would have it would cost you 70 MK to buy use of key and key control. And if you were a technician, you would have 60 martial knowledge left over to make it two techniques. And if you were any other class, as long as you had 20 or 25, you can make a good technique. And if you were a weapon master, you'd be sad and would want the three-point version of it instead. Pretty good, though. Good luck is not worth taking, in my opinion. It reduces your fun level by one point from three to two. And at mastery, that means you will only fumble on a one. That sounds pretty good, right? Natural one on a D100 eventually being your only failure result. If you want that, then sure. Eventually, once you get that mastery and those skills, it's worth it. Because then you will never fumble, basically. But since there's only a 3% chance to fumble anyways, making it 2% isn't a big difference. So why bother? Then again, I'm an advocate for taking bad luck, the opposite of this, which makes it one higher. Or no, two higher. Because I think it's worth it, <laughs> to be honest. Key recovery. If you're a technician, you might want to take it. Because it basically means after a fight, as long as there were a couple of narrative minutes going by, you got all your key back. Uh, I would take it at least uh, at level... Uh, uh, any level is actually pretty good, whether it's 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or minutes. Because at base, every hour, that means if you have more than 24 key, or 12 key, if you sleep for 12 hours, that means you probably didn't recover all your key overnight. So you're better off taking it so it's once every 10 minutes, because then you're guaranteed to get all your key back when you rest. Jack of all trades. It's very good. I think out of all the advantages in the core rulebook, it is the... Besides the one required to take on certain classes like Wizard and Mentalist, it is the most commonly taken one because it means you can make any skill check you want, whenever you want, and have a reasonable shot of, of succeeding. If you want to be versatile in what you can do, Jack of All Trades is the skill for you, man. It's just very good as well. It gives you a plus 10 bonus in all of your secondary abilities. So if you're a skill monkey, you might want to take Jack of All Trades and Knowledge in a Field. And you might want to just be Super Skill Man, because that's the other way in the core rulebook to get more, more out of your skills. Natural Armor is pretty bad. 
in my opinion. It's one creation point for two armor against any non-energy based armor. It's basically a freer layer of armor that gives you two AT across the board, and it it stacks. It's just a plus two. It doesn't follow the rules for layers of armor, so it always gives you plus two. Why is it bad then? A player might ask. Why should I not take natural armor? It sounds really good. Because if I were to reason it out in my head, 118 means I take 10% less damage. So if I have two, that means I take 20% less damage. So, you know, that's pretty good. 20% less damage in every hit. I'm a sold, you might say. However, oh, 2AT is small potatoes against anyone you'd want that AT for. In the early game, oh, sorry for yawn coming. <clears throat> In the early game, that 2 AT is great. Once you hit level 3 or 4 and you're doing a fairly like high action campaign, that 2 AT is suddenly being ignored. And maybe that 4 AT that you have with your armor on top of it is also being ignored. What this does, though, is if you're going for the high end of armor, it becomes a lot better. So I feel it's a great pick for Weapon Masters who want to wear heavy armor. Because then you can have over 10 AT and negate the effects of characters who ignore AT. That is when you want to take natural armor. For any other character, I feel it is a waste of a creation point. You would rather pick anything else, I feel. Next is Mystical Armor. This one is a lot better. It grants you a natural armor of 4 against energy-based attacks. Uh, it doesn't like natural... It does the same thing as natural armor, but it's for energy attacks. So that's fire, electricity, cold, and energy. And it's 4 AT. This is very good. But you just said natural armor is, is bad, and most attacks are physical, right? In the early game, you're right. But in the mid and late game, lots of enemies start throwing out energy beams and attacks that are energy based. Because in the late game of Anima, or in the mid game even, most enemies you fight will probably have aura extension to weapons. And they will probably have an energy based damage type to ignore a lot of your AT because of key. Or if they're a wizard, they're firing lasers at you. If they're a mentalist, they're throwing fire, ice, or lasers at you. So if that's the mid and end game, having four energy AT is just really good. And armor is very, it's very hard to find armor that isn't magical that gives you energy AT. So I would recommend this one over natural armor any day of the week. It is just a million times better. It combines with the, uh, with the energy armor and key and with that alone and the greater energy armor in Domus exit without any armor, you could have 10 energy based AT. That's amazing. That's just really good. You should get that one. Don't get the other one. Get get this one. It's way better. Untiring. This one is deceptively powerful. Being that it's very powerful. If you want to use fatigue points willy-nilly to get those plus 15 bonuses, or if you want to get the key ability, let's you spend up to 5 fatigue points in an ability, you pick Untiring. Because if you think of it like this, let's say you have 10 con. You're building your character around this advantage, basically. And you pick Untiring level 3, giving you 9 more fatigue points. You now have 19 fatigue points. Giving you 15 fatigue points you can freely spend and get no penalties. That's pretty good. That's a over multiple attacks. That's a each one is plus 15. That's like a, ooh, what's the math? 15 times 15? Well, 15 times 10 is 150 times that by 5. It's a big it's a big bonus. I don't feel like doing the math in my head. Actually, let's just pull the calculator, and I'll do it right on my calculator. I'm not sure if you can see it based on OBS, but I'll just do the math in the calculator. 15 times 15 equals 225 bonus overall. So that means... And every encounter you go for, if you use 15 of your fatigue points every account encounter and then rest in between, that means you have a plus 225 that you get to use throughout the battle. 
in increments of anywhere from 30 to 75 based on how many fatigue points you can make use of per turn. That's really amazing. It's even better if you're a wizard, because you can also use your fatigue points to get more MA. That's 30 more MA per spell cast. That's, if you're using core rulebook standards, three more add effects. It's just amazing. I'd recommend it as one. Even if you're not building a character around using fatigue, just having three more fatigue points is very nice. Uncommon size. This is a flavor advantage. If you want a power game, this is not for you unless you're power gaming towards stealth by reducing your size by five. If you want to go for a particular look for your character, like the skinny anime boy who is really strong, this is what you pick. When it comes to actual usefulness, it is not useful. Starting wealth. I feel like this one's pretty bad. You might say, but this should, yeah, that's 10,000 gold crowns you can get. Or hell, even 2,000. That's a lot of money. It is. And I feel this one is only good if you're a webmaster. Because at level 1, you could utilize 2,000 gold crowns and lots of wear armor to wear like full play at level 1 and just have it. If you're anyone else, what the fuck are you buying? You can't buy uncommon items if you're a character creation. Which means you sure as hell can't buy magical shit from the from the Promethean exit book. So what the fuck are you buying? Nothing. There's nothing in the game that you could reasonably buy that's available to you without some GM fiat to even spend 2,000 gold crowns on. Now, if you're doing a campaign where having a lot of money is good and maybe you want to invest that money in like a base of operations, that's when you would take starting wealth because then it would make lots of sense. So on those kind of campaigns, starting wealth is great. In most campaigns, if you're not webmaster, starting wealth is pretty trash. So it's very prominent. But I believe on webmaster, starting wealth is great. If you want to be a knight at level one, you pick starting wealth probably to get the armor, get the weapon, get the horse, get all get everything you need to pull off the motif. Regeneration, basic, advanced, and greater. In normal circumstances, I tell you this advantage is pretty meh. Until you are a wizard or a mentalist. In which case you have spells that can raise your regeneration level further beyond. And if you have like 10 con or you're like a Vitala from those who walk amongst us. Suddenly at level 1 you can get up to like a natural regeneration of like 16 all the time. If you're making a character like that, this is a good one. It allows you to make the hyper regenerating anime character. So if that's what you want, take it. Without it, uh, if you're in a party with low healing or no healing, it's good for cutting down your recovery time for your weapon master by getting a lot more for t uh, regeneration levels. Other than that, it's not that good. Elan. This one is very subjective. The Elan powers are very powerful. I'd recommend taking Elan at level 2 or higher, though. Level 1 land is not very good. Level 2 and 3 are very good. The kind of powers you get from worshipping a god in this game are ridiculous. But this is an advantage you build your character around. It's not one you pick for, for lol. It's one that defines your character. Because unless you pick level 1. If you pick level 1, then it's not that big of a deal. Level 2 and 3, that means your character is like the equivalent of a D&D cleric for that god. Right. You are getting actual like powers with like meaning behind them at that point at 45 and 60. So keep that in mind with this one. I could go through all the shods and barrels and I think I will in a separate video. But for now, just know this is really good. If you want it for the play that divine character angle, you should take it. Oh, oops. Immunity to pain and fatigue. A character with disadvantage is especially resistant to the effects of pain and fatigue, and you reduce their penalties caused by pain and fatigue by half. The pain part is really good. Pain is a rather common state to be put in, and the all-action penalties can be rather big from it. So cutting them in half is pretty nice. The fatigue half is useless. 
unless you are fatigue man and you're pulling off everything and going down to low fatigue. But the fatigue penalties only get bad once you're down to one fatigue. But the pain side of it alone makes his advantage worth taking. Uh, the gift, again, it's a prerequisite for playing a wizard or a similar character. So therefore it's good because you need it for magic. It gives you plus 10 MR2, which is nice. But the big theory is that you take it is if you're a wizard. Not much to say about it. It's a get Eber advantage. C Supernatural is perhaps the best advantage in the book. The gift lets you see magic, but this lets you see magic, psychic matrices, spiritual creatures, and basically anything that would normally be invisible to the normal high. And it removes the blinded penalty for those kind of things attacking you. If you're not a wizard, you really want this. If you're anyone, you want to get C Supernatural, rather through this advantage, or through a magical item as soon as you can. Because the worst way to die in this game is if you get hit by some attack that you cannot see because you don't got it. There are a lot of ways to get it. This is the easiest way to get it. So if you have a free creation point just floating around, take it. Night vision. Not as useful. Still useful. Let's you ignore darkness penalties, which don't come up very often. But it also cuts magical darkness penalties in half. So if you're fighting a lot of dark mages, take it. If you're not, then maybe not. Either way, it's still nice. Fortunates. This is a very subjective advantage. It means you were born under a lucky star. And generally, you are lucky than the other players around you. That means you'll never walk into a trap, is how I see it. Or an ambush. If someone's being ambushed or walking into a trap, it ain't you. It's the guy next to you, probably. So the way I do this advantage is that when someone would walk into a trap, I would roll for who's walking into it, and I would exclude the players of fortunate. Or if it was an ambush, same thing. Or if I'm picking anything at random that's bad, I never pick them. And if it's something good, it happens to always be them. That's how I might want to roll it, but you might want to do it differently. It's up to you. Free access to any psych discipline is like the other one that only gives you one, but it lets you pick all of them. This is really good if you want to be a mentalist who has access to everything and is more versatile. Like the gift, it's a gatekeeper, so therefore it's good because you need it. Quick reflexes makes you give get loads of initiative. Initiative is an interesting stat in this game. If you're a technician, quick reflexes is either one you take or you don't take. Because you might be made building techniques of initiative. And you might not take it because of it. Or because you are, you will take it. Going first is very good in Anima. Surprising someone is even better by beating their initiative by 150. If you want to build a surprise character using initiative modification... Or you just want to make sure you're not going last and you're wearing heavy armor and you want to offset the negatives from using your heavy stuff. You take quick reflexes. And if you're just looking to send a CP and you're not sure what to get, this one's a safe one to invest into. Plus 25 initiative is really good. Because the only way to get more initiative is leveling up and finding gear or using magic to speed up, basically. It's pretty good. I like it. It's a nice, safe, generic advantage take. Learning! I wouldn't recommend it. It gives you more experience points, and I feel the only reason you would take it is to offset an experience malice from playing as a Nephilim. I don't like it. The amount of extra points you get per session, they do add up. But it just means at the end of the day, you might level up one session ahead of your peers at some point, and then just always be a session or two ahead of them. If that's what you want, then go for it. If you don't really care about being slightly better, then not. But if you want to be a level ahead, you want the advantage. It just gives you straight up 100 experience, because then you will always be a level ahead of your, your peers. And it will just be a better version of learning, because you won't get less experience than your friends, usually. Natural Learner. It basically gives you a class modifier or a special modifier in this case to a secondary ability a plus 10 20 or 30 per level i believe we just double check yeah per level 
if you want to just get high in one skill, this is the one you take. You can also do it in a field for similar bonuses. However, it is not as good. Uh, spending two creation points is a plus five per level to a bunch of skills, Two and three is plus ten. It's still really good, though. A plus ten to a whole boatload of skills is just nice. And getting it per level is also nice. It's, uh, if you want to be a skill monkey and just get all these skill advantages, this is, this is one you take. It's not bad at all. Exceptional resistances. They increase your resistances by 25 or 50. If you want to be a... The one I would pick out of these two is either physical or magic. Physical makes you very resilient to crits. Magic makes you resilient to everything else. This PSR one isn't as good because many PSR checks allow you to default MR as well. And you... Yeah. It also only gives you one resistance to get you more resistant against. Whereas these guys, MR gives you one, and PHR gives you three of them. PHR gives you the most value, but VR and DR are very uncommon. But the PHR is incredibly common from being crit. So if you're getting crit a lot, or you're going to be a frontline fighter, this one's good. If you're worried about wizards wrecking you, this one's good. Now we're on to magical advantages. You must be a class with the Mystic Archetype or a character of the Gift to pick these. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's I misread that. I remember. It's not the Mystic Archetype. You just need to have the Gift to get these. Or weave spells in some other way to get these. So, Elemental Compatibility. Uh, you get plus 20 MA to a specific Elemental Spell Path. And minus 20 to the opposed one. And no bonus or negative to another one. If you pick Necromancy, you get a minus 20 to all other paths. Really good! If you want to specialize in one school of magic more than the others, Elemental Compatibility is the way to go. Natural Knowledge of a Path gives you level 40 in a path of magic without investing magic level points. If you have low intelligence, this is, this is really good. It allows you to know more spells than you normally should. And even if you have high intelligence, you're saving 40 magic level points for it. And can then use those on meta magic instead. Or going further along a magic path than you normally would. Contested Spell Mastery. Not as good. It's good if you want to make a character based around countering wizards or other supernatural characters. It allows you to clash your spells with other spell-like abilities. And then send them back at them, basically. If you want to do that, then that's a cool character concept. You should build around it. If you're any other kind of wizard, though, I wouldn't recommend it. Aptitude for Magical Development. What this does is only really... It lets you sp cast spells that you shouldn't be able to. It allows you to cast spells if you have three more intelligence points. So in core rulebook, that means the that increases how much Xeon you can invest in the spells. And in the core exit system, it just means you can cast better spells. It's really good if you want to cast big spells while your intelligence is low. But this advantage, uh, it stays good for a very long time and actually is good all the time. There's no downside to it. You should pick it if you want to be a, a powerful Archmage. I'm just saying she's none beneath this chick's titties, but no, no more advantages down here. All of them over here now. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> so this one is half a tune stream. So it gives you plus 20 to your MA and your MR in five magical paths of a segment of the magical tree. In the rest, you have minus 20. Uh, the only restriction to this is that you can't, that necromancy is ignored by it. You can't be half attuned to the tree of necromancy. Sorry. Uh, if you want to be more of a generalist mage and pick a bunch of spells and be very versatile, this is the one for you. If you're a specialist mage, though, it's useless. Improved innate magic is great for a wizard who wants to specialize in innate magic. Innate magic is using your MA to cast spells instantly for free one at a time. 
and it allows you to add plus 10 to plus 30 to your MA in regards to figuring out what spells you can cast for free. So if you have 100 MA, like the spell suggests, it means you cast a spell that's young power of 40 for free. But with this advantage, if you took level 2, he could then cast a spell with 60 Zionic value for free. Without having to charge up, you just do it. It's very nice. It's a build around advantage, as well as one you can just pick up so you can always make sure you can cast your basic offensive spell. Unspoken casting and gestureless casting is great if you are bound and still need to cast your spells, and also for casting your spells stealthily. If you have a free CP, they're good to pick. If you're a stealthy wizard, they're also good to pick. Superior magic recovery is the one advantage here that is good for every wizard. It either doubles, triples, or quadruples your Zionic recovery rates, which is amazing. I'd recommend picking it up if you want to be a very serious spellcaster, or especially so if you're a summoner. Summoners will generally take the gift as to only just to get this other advantage along with it. Now we're on to the second ones. Amplify Sustain Power. This one's real good. It allows you to treat any sustain, which is maintained power, as if it was one level higher than normal that they would normally attain from it. That means their shields are a bit bigger, their ability to fly is better, it's just nice. PP recovery is pretty bad. I find most psychics I play with as a DM completely forget they can invest PP into their skills because due to other advantages, they just get free points of, uh, of success. They get higher difficulty levels for free. So this guy is uh, is just not very useful in comparison to those ones, which is unfortunate. So generally, they don't even bother having spare PP. Real shame. That means the psychic fatigue resistance is also bad, because you never fail your abilities, and you never will take fatigue damage. You only take this one if you're worried about a nemesis user, making it so you don't auto-succeed. Passive concentration is kind of nice. It's allows you to concentrate, giving you a plus 20 on your potential, I believe. Really good. Sight Inclination. It lets you uh, pick a discipline when uh, that you are specialized in, and you get a additional degree of difficulty success, basically, in that field. Very powerful. Uh, there's Focus, so if you spend PP to improve your projection in a specific ability, instead of plus 10, it's plus 20. It's nice, but it's pretty generic. And finally, Extreme Concentration. Uh, you double the benefit you gain from Concentration, which increases it from a plus 10 to plus 20. This paired with Passive Concentration is a nice combo. And it allows you to get a free plus 20 for 4 CP, meaning it's not that great, but it's okay. It's nice if you want to be very vanilla and, like, clean. Now we're on disadvantages. First one is the one I recommend every player character takes because it's not so bad. And it's a free CP. Bad luck. It increases your fumble rate to 5. Or plus 2 points for things of greater than 5 or greater than 3. Not so bad. Gets you a CP. Great. Blind. It's self-explanatory. Makes it blind. Take it if you're willing to die, or have other means of vision that don't require your physical eyes. Deafness. You can't hear shit. If you're willing to miss out on every conversation ever, take it. If not, don't take it. Mute. If you don't like talking, take it. If you want to talk, don't take it. Simple as that. Near sighted. This one's a fun one. It forces you to wear glasses, basically, if you want to negate the penalties or some of the penalties. And this makes you blind, basically. It's beautiful. I think it's a fun, flareful advantage. And it gives you a reason to invest into some cosmetic items like glasses that would normally be ignored in the game. Which I think is cool. I like it. It's flareful and it's fun. Severe Allergy. This one is also fun. I'd recommend as a player to let the DM pick it, not you. Or make sure the DM is okay with your choice when you pick it. 
But there are some cool allergies that you could think of taking, and then it can make some pretty funny scenes when, like, the party finds out you're allergic to, like, grain, and then you're doing something in the grain silo for some reason. Serious Vice is another safe one to pick, because as long as your vice is easy to obtain, like chewing tobacco, you don't need to suffer, suffer the penalties unless you're, like, stranded somewhere. So, nine times out of ten, this is a real safe one to pick. Atrophied Limb is a very dangerous one to pick. It gives you a minus 80 penalty to all physical action to require the use of the limb. Which basically means, if you're going to be a physical fighter, don't pick it. Because... If you're going to go into a sword fight, you need your legs to move around. That's a minus 8 hit and minus 8 hit defense. If you're a wizard that has gestureless casting, this is a good combo. You could have, like, atrophied arms. And since you don't need to make gestures, you wouldn't get the negative for casting your spells. But then you'd get the negative for trying to move stuff with your arms. So it's a cool one for, like, a wizard, bad for a non-wizard and stuff. Serious Illness. I call this one the side quest disadvantage. You give your party a side quest to try and save you. Uh, you basically have around six months to live, or you die of your serious illness. Every month, you take a cumulative minus 10 election penalty. And eventually, you'll die. However, it's just here, and I recommend going with this suggestion, that there should be a cure for the disease. And it gives your party a side quest to go to find the cure of the disease to keep you alive because they like you. So you might spend a few months ingratiating yourself with the party as your disease gets worse and then eventually going, guys, I'm dying. I was hoping you could help me find a cure. And that's cool. Physical weakness. <sighs> I recommend not taking this one. Because if you get crit, you're going to die. Instantly. If you're okay with one bad roll getting you killed, then you might want to take this one. But if you're if you get salty from dying to a bullshit roll, don't take it. You'll only invite pain. Deep Sleeper, however, is a much safer one. It's uh it's kinda of funny take if you're like, you know, sleeping and then you guys get ambushed on watch and you're just not there because you're just in a deep sleep. It's just how you don't get you woken up, you have a minus two to your nose skill. You're just out. Just asleep like I wanna be right now, because I'm yawning so much, God. Oh God! Oh, sorry. But yeah, if you're if you're cool with being the the sleepy dude on watch, that's it's a fun one to take. I like it personally. Deduct two points from a characteristic. Uh, you should pick this one if you want to make a cripple, or if you want to make a character who you rolled high in your stats, and you're willing to take a bump down in stats to get SCP because the stat you had a high roll in is not one you will care about. So it's pretty good. I like it. Unfortunate is the opposite of being fortunate. That means terrible things happen to you. Uh, so the way I roll with it is that you fall on every trap, every ambush is, is at you, and yeah. So if you pick it, I'd recommend being a very tanky character who can endure all the terrible tragedies that happen to you. I would not recommend it if you are a squishy wizard, because you will probably die very early on. Easily Possessed is one that lots of players take. They think it will never come up, and then they get possessed that one time, and it's game over. What Easily Possessed does is it gives you a random kill switch, where at some point, and the DM will likely forget about it too at this point, by the way, that you will both forget until it's too late, and then you'll realize that you've been possessed and therefore killed. So if you're okay with the funny kill switch that happens at some point around the campaign, you should take it. And if you're not, you really shouldn't. Exhausted. It doubles fatigue points and it makes every and reduces your base fatigue by one point. Or I say it doubles the fatigue penalties. The fatigue penalties at base tier are not very important. So doubling them is makes them like actual penalties. Having a lot of fatigue is bad, but not so bad. If you're playing a character who doesn't really want to use your fatigue points, save for emergencies, then this one's okay. Severe phobia. This is a fun one. Do you want? Are you an arachnophobe? Maybe you hate the outdoors. Maybe clowns, even the creeps. If you want that to be a character trait of yours, you should take this one to get a free CP out of it. Vulnerable to pain. Do you want to die from the first time a guy gives you the pain? Staz effect. 
If so, you should pick it, because you'll die. But until then, it's a free CP. Sickly's a good one to pick if you want a free CP, actually, though. Diseases are very uncommon in Anima. Most monsters will not give you a disease. So, it's a pretty safe pick. Slow Healer is, uh... It's pretty painful. To be honest. Half healing, including magical healing. Oof! That means when you get hurt, you're going to be resting for a long time. But if you're doing a campaign where you have long rest periods, it's not so bad, obviously. So I'd take Slow Healer in a campaign like that. Slow Learner is kind of like Fast Learner, where at first it won't matter at all, and eventually you might be like a session or two worth of experience behind the party after about... At negative four, I'd say it would take about eight to nine session to be a full session behind worth of experience. And at eight, it would take about four. So every four sessions, you are losing a full session worth of experience at the worst case. So if you're okay with eventually becoming a bit weaker than the rest of your party, then you should pick it. Early game, you won't notice a difference. Slow reactions is a dangerous one to pick. Going minus 30 or minus 60 slower is very painful. But if you're making techniques with key or mentalism that give you more initiative, maybe you take it so those techniques just kind of balance you out and don't really do anything. And therefore, you just bought two free CP. So there you go. Simple the Magic's great if you want to be like frozen in blocks of ice and stuff all the time. There aren't very many instant death MR effects, so this one isn't as dangerous as being physically weak. Uh, same with vulnerable to poisons, but there are a lot more poisons that instantly kill you than magic, so be careful on that one. Ugly or unattractive. If you have more than seven in appearance and it was generated by a die roll, you can pick this to have only two instead. And it's a free CP, so if you're okay at being ugly, then pick it. You're a fucking deformed monstrosity, but you are got one more CP. Uh, vulnerable to heat slash cold is one that doesn't come up very often, so it's generally just free CP. But the one time you fight like a mentalist, you specialize in the thing you're weak against, you're probably dead. So have fun. Again, it's like a random kill switch, like being possessed, where you'll randomly die at some point, probably, to the effect. So be aware of that when you pick it. Magical disadvantages. Oral requirements. Get your mind out of the gutter. Uh... It means you got to speak to cast your spells. Not so bad. If you want to be a more traditional mage who shouts out your spells as you do them, it's pretty good. Same with required gestures, but you're making hand motions or doing something. Pretty good. Magical exhaustion could be really bad if you're constantly casting big spells. It will make you eventually collapse from exhaustion. If you're playing an old like mage, that could be really cool, like thematic one. But anyone else, it's bad Shh, to pick because eventually... Well, it's not that bad, actually. If you have a decent fatigue pool, then you probably won't be too affected by it. Shamanism. Uh, in Arcana Exit, you can't pick this one anymore because it's a school of magic to do with now and has some benefits to it, actually. But in Core Rulebook, it means, like a D&D &D wizard, your spells require material components to cast. Each spell requires a different component determined by the GM. This is a lot of work for you and the DM to figure out the components for your spells and figure out how you can gather them. So it makes casting your spells a big, big pain in the ass. But if you're willing to put up with it, you're rewarded with two creation points. Magical ties. You are tied to the same roots as the magic path, so your capacity to develop or specify is like paths is practically impossible. So, basically, you don't get free access spells, and you can only develop your passive spells and cannot, like, cherry-pick them with magic levels. So if you want to specialize in schools of magic, this one's not so bad to pick. Slow recovery of magic cuts your Xeon regeneration by half. Don't pick this one. You will regret it, because you'll run out of Xeon and spend, like, two months in an inn and be very bored. Magic blockage is a very cool uh, is a very cool thematic one. If you want to be a wizard who can only recover Xeon via like a Xeonic battery or by draining it of some by someone, 
that's pretty cool. You look like a Xeon vampire. That's pretty cool. But if you want to be a more traditional wizard, it's a very dangerous one to pick. I'd recommend if you were taking magic blockage, you play as a warlock. So if you're at a Xeon, you can still be useful. Action requirement. It means you must roll a skill check of difficult or higher to basically do your spells. And it's a specific action, so dancing, like kissing someone, or whatever else. The action, though, is a difficult skill check to perform, generally. Now for the psychic ones. Psychic exhaustion. You lose double the fatigue points when you fail, but you never fail, so it's a free CP. Uh, psychic consumption, even better. When you fail, you lose life points as well as fatigue for when you fail stuff, but you never fail, so that's two more CP. Great, eh? One power at a time. This one's action disadvantage. It means you can't split up your MA for multiple castings of abilities. That makes it a serious disadvantage and something that might actually make you a worse mentalist. So pick it if you don't want three free CP down there. No concentration is also a big disadvantage that could actually reduce your ability to do stuff. Again, if you want a real disadvantage, pick this one. But if you want free CP, pick these two. They're just OP. Because with the other advantages in this book and using mental patterns, you will never fail. Unless you are playing against someone who is using use of nemesis against his enemy. And if that's the case, just run away. Let's go on to our next book, which is Arcana Exit. These are all magic.